Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum at Harvard Kennedy School. I'm Doug Elmendorf, uh, the Dean of the Kennedy School, and I'm delighted to see you all here for this year's Malcolm Wiener Lecture in International Political Economy. We're going to pack a tremendous amount of education and fun into the next hour and a quarter, so I will speak fast and get out of the way quickly. The Wiener Lecture in International Political Economy was established nearly 30 years ago through a gift from Malcolm Hewitt Wiener. I've had the great pleasure to get to know Malcolm during the past two years. Uh, Malcolm was an economics major at Harvard College and went on to found and lead an incredibly successful investment firm. He is also a widely recognized and published expert on Aegean prehistory. Malcolm sends me his papers, which I try to understand. He recently sent me a paper intended, as he said, for a general audience, which is about my speed in this area. Uh, the paper was a worrying but fascinating read, titled The Impact of Climate Change, Famine, Pandemics, and Warfare in the Collapse of Civilizations. And I recommend it. Uh, Malcolm has been one of the Kennedy School's most uh, committed and important friends for three decades. Without his staunch support, we would not have the Wiener Center for Social Policy, the multiple Wiener professorships in social policy, the Wiener Auditorium, or this lecture. And joining Malcolm tonight uh, are his wife Carolyn and his daughters Elizabeth and Kate, uh, who are students at other schools at Harvard. And to all of the Wiener family, welcome and thank you very much for your support. Today's Wiener lecturer is the very distinguished Klaus Schwab, and we are so fortunate to have him here with us today. Professor Schwab needs no introduction, and you have come to hear him, not me. So I will be very brief in the introduction I will offer. He is, of course, the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. The forum's mission statement is about improving the state of the world through public-private cooperation. The forum explains that organizations are accountable to stakeholders in all parts of society. And the forum brings together people from around the world, from the public and private sectors, from international organizations, and from academic institutions. The World Economic Forum now employs people in Geneva, New York, Beijing, Tokyo, San Francisco, and maybe places that I have not kept up with. Uh, nearly 20 years ago, Klaus and his wife Hilda created the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, which seeks to recognize and disseminate in initiatives that have significantly improved people's lives and have the potential to be replicated on a global scale. The foundation supports a network of over 350 social entrepreneurs across the world, and we have the tremendous opportunity to teach and learn from these social entrepreneurs here at the Kennedy School. Klaus has also created the Forum for Young Global Leaders for people under 40 years old. And once again, we have the tremendous good fortune to be part of training those leaders and learning from them. There are also a tremendous number of specific initiatives at the World Economic Forum where faculty members here uh, have been involved and again have, we hope, both taught and learned from those interactions. I could go on and describe Klaus's many other accomplishments and awards but I will limit myself to highlighting just one more and perhaps the most crucial part of Klaus's resume. Klaus Schwab is an alumnus of the Kennedy School. Uh, this is uh, the 50th anniversary uh, of his graduation uh, from the Kennedy School. Uh, and at the end of the uh, event tonight, we will present Klaus with the Harvard Kennedy School Dean's Award. Uh, Klaus, before that, will deliver the Wiener Lecture, and after he has finished his remarks, he will engage in a conversation uh, with our very own David Gergen, uh, of course, a distinguished faculty member here at the Kennedy School uh, and director of our Center for Public Leadership, uh, who, like uh, Klaus, really needs no introduction, and in your case, David, this audience is very well acquainted with you. I will just move quickly on, because we have yet another special opportunity today. It really is a, an embarrassment of riches this afternoon. Uh, the renowned cellist Yo-Yo Ma is with us today. <laughs> when he heard... <laughs> uh, when he heard uh, that his friend Klaus Schwab would be here today, 
uh, Yo-Yo Ma offered to come and uh, perform in honor of his longtime friend. Uh, Yo-Yo Ma was a recipient of the National Medal of Arts in 2001, the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2011, and the Polar Music Prize in 2012. Um, it's time for me to get out of here. Let's give a warm welcome to Yo-Yo Ma. To hear me speak, um, but I will play for you. Um, in, I was trying to think of what to play in relation to strengthening collaboration in a fractured world, and I think um, Dr. Schwab was, um, talks a lot about how to create a narrative uh, in a fractured world, a shared narrative. And so I thought I'd play for you something that perhaps offers a different perspective. Um, first of all, uh, a piece, a favorite piece of the late Pablo Casals, um, who was a really great citizen, responsibility, was very much part of his uh, uh, form of expression, and either in playing or not playing. And one of his favorite songs for him symbolized freedom. Uh, and he's a Catalan from Catalonia. And this is one of the national uh, folk songs called Song of the Birds. And so if you imagine uh, the perspective, the geographic perspective of the world from a bird's point of view, where does that lead you? Stand, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> what? 
What great honor and pleasure to be here after 50 years. Of course, I have visited my school often in between. But I have to tell you, when I look back, nothing has influenced my life more than my year's stay here at the Kennedy School, or at that time, it was still called the Litauer Center. And I want to, when I look around, I see the deans um, whom uh, I have followed over those five decades. And I want to thank you, because we always had an excellent cooperation. And I think the Kennedy School is an essential pillar in the build-up of the World Economic Forum. And even if I go back, many people ask me, why is the World Economic Forum in existence? It's a Kennedy School. Because when I was here, of course, I, I followed quite a number of courses also across the river at the Harvard Business School. And I came back and son to, to Switzerland. And um, an editor asked me, you have been now in Cambridge, so you should know everything about modern management. Why don't you write a book on social responsibility, how to manage a company in a social, socially responsible way? And so I wrote the book, and I conceptualized probably for the first time what is called now the multi-stakeholder concept, which means that business leaders should not only be accountable to and serve shareholders, but stakeholders, which means all those communities who have a stake in the company. And here, of course, you have governments, you have employees, you have trade unions, you have civil society, and so on. And that's the concept on which the Forum, World Economic Forum is built. After writing this book, we tried to create, or I tried to create a platform where stakeholders could meet. In the meantime, we have extended the notion of stakeholders. It's not only governments, business, and civil society. We feel that academia, as the holder of truth, plays an essential role, particularly today. And we feel also that the young generation sitting here has to be integrated, particularly in a world where the average age is somewhere around 26, 27 years. We have to shape the world together with the young people. But in a fractured world, we need also the voice of the heart. We need cultural leaders. We need religious leaders. And that's the reason, Yo Yo Ma, I'm so thankful that you are here today as one of our members of the Board of Trustees, because you show that culture, the language of the heart, is an essential element of our humanity. And I think the piece you played was so touching. So it reminded us that we should not speak only about politics and economics, but maybe also about what makes us different? I remember in Davos, um, um, Eric Schmidt mentioned once, um, the next decade will be a battle between robots and humans. If we want to win this battle, we have to know what makes us human. And when I listen to you, I know what makes us human. So. The Forum would never be in existence without uh, my stay here. And today, I have to say, we have further developed the stakeholder concept. We feel 
that it is not only business who should serve its stakeholders, but business itself is a stakeholder of our global community. So when we look at all the challenges in the world, we, need, we know that those problems, environment, terrorism, whatever you name it, can only be solved through collaborative efforts of all stakeholders. And that's what the forum is today, a platform for stakeholders to cooperate. And I'm just coming out of, um, we had a meeting um, the last two days, and I'm proud because the forum now as an official international organization for public-private cooperation has become much more than a meeting or meetings. Um, in uh, New York, we brought together 800 stakeholders for really a big workshop and so many concrete ideas with tremendous impact came out. So let me stop here. I know it is uh, a very prestigious lecture. Thank you, Mr. Wiener, for having inaugurated this series of lectures. But I feel much more comfortable when there is a debate. The forum is built on interaction. And to have the pleasure with my mentor, you, Professor Gergen, to be in dialogue is probably more interesting for the audience than just to listen to me. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you, Klaus. We're, we are definitely privileged and thankful that you've come back. And we want to thank you not only for what you've done for this school, but what you've done for the world. You've, you've devoted your life to making the world a better place, something which goes to the heart of what the Kennedy School is all about. It's been striking to us as we've had the pleasure, and, and, and this goes back to Dean, uh, Dean, uh, Dean Elwood, um, that when you brought the Young Global Leaders Program here for executive education and then the Schwab Fellows. But there are two countries in the world now in which the Young Global Meet Leaders have emerged. Tell us just a bit about that in, in terms of the governance. Yes, um, actually this um, notion to integrate young leaders uh, <coughs> is part of the World Economic Forum for since many years. And I have to say, um, when I mention now names like Mrs. Merkel, um, even uh, Vladimir Putin and so on, they all have been young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. But um, what we are very proud of now is the young generation, like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Pres of uh, Argentina and so on, that we penetrate the cabinets. So yesterday I was at a, rece at a reception for Prime Minister Trudeau, and I know that half of this cabinet, or even more half of, uh, half of this cabinet, are for our uh, actually young global leaders of the world they create for And that's true in Argentina too. Wow. Yeah. Sorry. That's true in Argentina as well. It's true in Argentina and uh, it's true in France now. Mm -hmm. I mean with the president, with a young global leader, but what is important for me is those young global leaders have an opportunity to come here. Right. And we have established uh, a course uh, now since several years. And I think it has, this cooperation has a tremendous impact because um, being here for a week uh, really creates a strong community. And we, in addition to the young global leaders, we have now the global shapers in uh, 450 cities around the world. I just wonder, is there any global shaper here? Yeah, no, yeah you see, you Terrific. see global shapers here. <laughs> um, and... Um, what is astonishing is to see um, how those young people really have a different mindset. Um, and I have great admi ad uh, admiration because when I have a group of global shapers in the room and I ask them, 
are you thinking in global terms or in national terms? The majority would say in global terms. Mm. If I ask them what is more important for you, to make money or to serve society, more certainly 80% uh, would raise their hand and would say serving society. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm very optimistic about the future of the world Vic, because with the young generation, I think right. we can build what I would call a new renaissance, particularly using technology, um, solving all the issues, uh, moving forward. Let's talk a bit about uh, technology and its impact. You, you've written a book, which I would commend to all of you, called, it just came out a couple of years ago, The Fourth Industrial Revolution. It sold over a million copies around the world, over a million copies. Uh, and it is essentially, Klaus argues that there were three earlier revolutions, one late 18th century, or early part of the 19th century, then late 19th century, early 20th century, then the third one starting in the 1960s with the digital age, and now since the advent of the 21st century, a new, a new industrial revolution that's even more influential. Can you tell us, describe this revolution to us as you see it? Yes, uh, very often people would say, um, um, <coughs> it's not a really a revolution, it's a prolongation of uh, the computer age which came into being in the 80s, uh, the last century already. Mm -hmm. But it's much more. If, if we look at this revolution, it's not characterized by one technology. You have so many technologies. You have nanotechnology, brain um, research, you have, uh, I mean, you name it. In, in, in essence, in the long run, what is very essential is to see that this new revolution will lead to a fusion of our biological, our digital, and our material existence. Mm -hmm. And look at, for example, the Internet of Things and many other, let's say, uh, new um, uh, uh, technologies, um, say what is, what is very important, they do not just, that's another difference, they do not just influence or improve what we are doing moving faster in the traffic or whatever it is, but they have an impact on us. They change us. Just look at how the internet has already changed, or big data is now changing the behavior of people. So um, they affect our identity. And when we look uh, for an explanation of uh, the problems we have now uh, um, in, in terms of Brexit or whatever you take, um, I think a lot has to do with the search of identity in a situation where you are confronted with a technology which most people do not, or with a technological wave and changes which most people do not understand. And so now I'm coming to a third characteristic of this revolution, the speed. Um, I wrote the book um, two and a half years ago, or actually just two years ago, and when I look at, at certain um, elements, I mentioned, for example, blockchain. Two years ago, I had to explain everybody what blockchain is. Mm -hmm. Today, every major bank has a research team to look how blockchain could impact mm -hmm. the business model. <laughs> um, if you look at, um, let's say, self-driving cars, um, uh, two years ago people assumed this will be reality somewhere around 2025. And now even in Switzerland, you have um, the first self-driving bus in one of the small cities in Switzerland. And you have one of the cantons now in Switzerland, uh, Canton of Zug, who is in, which is introducing black st uh, bl a blockchain for all financial transactions, tax declarations, and so on. So the speed is enormous. Mm -hmm. And all those elements together, I think, create a revolution which affects us, which is not just a technological revolution. It's an economic, it's a political, and it's a social revolution. Mm. You, the book is fundamentally optimistic. You call yourself a pragmatic 
optimist in the book. There was one area where you seemed to be worried, and that was the question of jobs and inequality as it relates to jobs. You're worried about women and jobs. And you pointed out that in 1990, the three biggest companies in Detroit had a market at a cap value of $36 billion and had 1.2 uh, million employees. And two years ago, the top three companies in Silicon Valley have a market cap of over a trillion dollars on only one-tenth as many employees, just 37,000 empl 137,000 employees. How do, we, how, do, how do we best address this? Because you, one hears it again and again, and it has entered into our politics, as you well know, not only in this country, but in Europe. We don't know, frankly, yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, we use words like we need upskilling, reskilling, yeah. but actually, um, let me address this issue from, from different angles. Um, first, um, I, if you look at the magnitude of, of this issue, um, I, I just take two, two figures. Um, in the US, as far as I know, more than 10 million people are driving vehicles. And more than 10 million people are working as cashiers uh, in, um, mm. in the distribution system, in retail. Uh, those jobs will probably have gone uh, to a large part in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So what we see is an erosion of the lower middle class. And um, um, of course, we, and we do not know yet, like in the, in the past revolutions, we had, um, uh, we had new jobs in the service sector, first in the industrial sector, mm -hmm. when we moved from agriculture to manufacturing and then from manufacturing to service. There were new jobs created over time. Now we do not know yet where those new jobs are coming from. Not everybody can become, let's say, a drone dispatcher or a, a robot polisher. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we, we have no, no clear, of course we will need more engineers, more, more. <coughs> uh, so this will create a kind of um, fraction in the society. You have the people like a, a, a bus driver, who knows, he may lose uh, his job in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. And in the, f in the first revolution, in the first uh, industrial revolution, you had this um, uh, level of society which was called proletariat. Today you have this new class of society which is called precariat, because they know they are in a precarious mm -hmm. uh, situation or they are already working in a uberized uh, situation because I don't know whether they still have an income tomorrow. Mm. So we don't know. Um, what I know is that probably one of the consequences will be that we have to um, redesign. We need an educational revolution point 4.0. Mm -hmm. um, I think the whole educational system has to be moved much more into the direction of lifelong learning, of a good combination of face-to-face uh, -face and uh, digital um, a transmission of, of knowledge and so on. But we haven't sorted through yet. And a last remark, I more an optimistic now. Mm -hmm. We may go through this transition uh, phase. We in Switzerland, we had, well, Two years ago, we had a, you know, Switzerland is a country of referendums. So we had a referendum mm -hmm. on should we introduce minimal guaranteed incomes? Mm -hmm. And even in my wife, uh, Hilde, who, um, when we talked about it, she, she said, no way. I mean, uh, my, we, we we're living in Geneva, we, we have a Puritanian uh, attitude. So how could someone get money from the government without working? Mm -hmm. um, but I, and I was asked by uh, the, the, um, uh, by the media what I'm thinking about, and I said it, it may be a good idea 
it's just not, a, we are just not yet uh, ripe for it. It may be in 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, and when you argue, let's say, with someone who has a job at minimal income, and instead of having this job at minimal income, he gets um, a guaranteed income, and he can choose the job. You could make the argument, uh, let's take a nurse or whatever it is, I don't want to pick up, a, pick out one job, but let's, let's take a nurse as an example, who is working, I don't know the, the salaries in, in the States, but I take it in Switzerland, she is working for uh, 4,000 Swiss francs, she will feel underpaid and will not, will not have a necessarily great job satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Now, if she gets a minimum income which is guaranteed and she chooses not to stay at home but to do some work, she will do it with much more enthusiasm. So um, I feel we may go into a kind of new renaissance where we see out of the fourth industrial revolution a fourth sector. So we have mm. Mm. Uh, evolving. We had of course, we had the agricultural sector, we had the manufacturing sector, we had the service sector, mainly as consequence of revolutions. And now you may find a, the creation of a fourth sector, which is the social service sector. So you don't worry anymore about your income, but you are free to serve society. And yes. that's the, uh, I'm sorry to be long, but that's the reason why um, I'm so much engaged in fostering social entrepreneurship mm -hmm. because we feel social entrepreneurship has to become a mainstream right. in society, not just being something marginalized, uh, good idealists. No, it has to be a, become a pillar of society to provide, for two reasons, to provide the jobs for those low, uh, no, I wouldn't say for those who will lose the job in the fourth industrial revolution, but second also, I'm coming from the, um, from, uh, the UN General Assembly, where there was a lot of discussion, of course, on how to implement the social development goals, um, and I think the social development goals, of course, government action, new technologies, but it needs a mobilization. We have to do it on the ground. We have to do it. Um, uh, everybody of us is challenged. So I'm an optimist. May, we may go into a new renaissance where people serve society, where people are free also to exercise creative uh, professions, being an artist. Maybe we Hopefully, we have many, many yo yo mas since if you never <laughs> will, nobody will reach your level of uh, <laughs> professionalism. Yeah. yeah, you said you said in the, in the book too that governments themselves might move in this direction of service and become public service centers. Yeah, that was an interesting idea. Yes, um, I think governments will be much more measured on the basis how they really fulfill the individual needs of citizens. Mm -hmm. And we see the first governments moving into this direction. Singapore, for example, mm -hmm. is, a, is a good example um, of, of a government which um, perceives itself, not so much in political terms, but how much it can really optimally fulfill the expectations of citizens in terms of health, in terms of education, right. in terms of social services. Mm -hmm. In terms of looking at countries that are, might be models or direct, uh, certainly suggest directions about a pre preparing people for jobs, uh, Germany, what, would, would, that stand, would Germany stand out? Or are there other countries that stand out? I, I would say Germany has a long tradition in um, um, uh, in uh, embracing the concept of uh, stakeholder mm -hmm. uh, democracy. Uh, when I grew up, 
um, the key word was social market economy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Germany is certainly um, a good example. Switzerland is a good example. Mm -hmm. um, um, but we don't have too many examples mm -hmm. yet. Good ones. Not enough. Yeah. Not enough. We're still struggling with this question. Uh, the uh, you you read about the importance of governments becoming more agile, and I know you have a particular concern about the regulatory state and how regulations are now written. And, and how, how that process might be revised. I think this is one of the b biggest challenge which we have because the technological progress is so fast, the governments cannot catch up anymore. And um, uh, by the way, it has also an impact on competitiveness. I remember I, I organized a meeting for, I, I can mention it here for Chancellor Merkel, with some of the real, of the CEOs of the highly advanced uh, dit, uh, uh, digital economy uh, companies. And um, I asked her afterwards, what is your impression? And then she says, uh, I see now the difference of uh, Silicon Valley with uh, Europe. Uh, so uh, I asked her, what is it? She said, look, in Silicon Valley, everything which is not forbidden <laughs> is allowed. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, everything which is not explicitly allowed is forbidden. <laughs> so um, <laughs> such a situation which we have. And when you look at um, the, the, let's say, difficulty or incapability of governments to follow the technological mm -hmm. progress, you have a situation where society loses the control over the um, uh, 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 technological progress. And you see the here in the discussion on big data, um, last year's the conflict between Apple and the government and right. so on. So we coined in, in or I coined in the book, the, the notion of agile governance. And what it means is that today with the fast technological progress, you cannot set regulations anymore, or create regulations anymore in the old fashion, where you have an innovation, you go through a parliamentary uh, government, uh, commission um, um, driven process, and after some years you come out with the necessary framework. You have to work uh, together on an ongoing basis to create self-binding protocols and principles and rules. Look at artificial intelligence, look at uh, the ownership of big data, and so on and so on. So what we have done in the World Economic Forum, uh, we created um, a campus on, um, in San Francisco uh, to, to uh, bring, um, to have a platform where governments and business continuously could cooperate also with civil society to make sure that those new technologies are human-centered. Because we have to have an objective, and the objective should be they have to serve humankind. So we work on artificial intelligence, we work on precision medicine, on drones, internet of things, and so on. And um, um, our dream or wish is uh, to create a whole network um, for such an approach, because it has to uh, be based on the ownership of governments around the world, and um, to have uh, such centers in each city mm. or in those cities mm -hmm. where really um, uh, technological progress is eminent. So um, I could imagine maybe when we meet again in five years or in three years, or with the speed of the fourth industrial revolution, maybe in one year, that we have also a center here. Mm -hmm. But y your central focus uh, in terms of, I've, I've heard you say, if you want to predict the future of a country, don't look anymore at its GDP growth, look at its rate of innovation. That's right, and um, I also, I was, yeah, it was very much in the news because I coined another uh, expression, I said, um, 
today we, we have moved, we are not anymore in the age of capitalism, we are in the age of talentism, which mm -hmm. means it's um, capital is abundant. If you have a good idea, you find so, you have so and so many investors who run after you. Uh, mm -hmm. But what is scarce, if you look what is, where is the scarcity? It's in good ideas, it's mm -hmm. in talents. So um, uh, talentism in some way is replacing mm -hmm. even conceptually mm -hmm. uh, capitalism. And it leads also to this gap of wages or of remuneration um, for talents versus non-talents and this um, polarization to a certain extent of society. So uh, certainly uh, I think we, 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 um, we will see conceptually, I mean talking here, it's a, it's a Wiener lecture, I should make a, a, a also say something about economics. <laughs> I, I feel, I feel um, that we need completely new concepts. We also haven't yet, um, maybe here at the Kennedy School, but I haven't found yet the right answers what economic policies we, we really need in, a, in times of shared economy, in times where there's let less materialism uh, among the young generation and so on. How do we, we deal with this situation? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we, we should go to the floor here in just a moment, but I have one more question for you. But if, if you do have a question, we're going to have a short time with uh, Q&A from the floor. So you might line up now, but let me ask you this question finally. And that is, uh, we, we have at this school, in this audience, some of the most promising members of the new generation, the rising generation. What advice do you have for them about preparing for lives of service and leadership in this new world? I, I would say, if I, if I would characterize, and I did it to a certain extent in the book, um, and I do it more in the new book which comes out at the end of the year, which is called Shaping the Fourth Industrial Revolution, I think we need uh, two capabilities. Um, it's um, emotional intelligence and uh, contextual intelligence. Today, where everything is inter uh, interdependent, um, we have to think, we have to learn to think in ecosystems, which um, people like to, how shall I say, to uh, particularly also in the academic world, to define in narrow lines a specific issues. But today everything is interwoven. And um, so contextual intelligence to, to be able to, to, um, to, to link the dots, to bridge the dots, I think becomes uh, mm -hmm. what, what young people should learn. And the other one is emotional intelligence because um, um, creativity, productivity, um, and I would say personal satisfaction comes mainly out of preserving your own identity but living in a um, diverse society. And if I look around here, I mean, it's such a diverse group. Um, but if you, if you are embedded into a diverse um, community, you really have to understand what are the motivations uh, behind the behavior of the people you deal with. Mm -hmm. And this needs emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe one word, because I'm very often, particularly, um, when I'm with the, with the young, with young leaders, and I remember uh, David when we had a uh, similar discussion several years ago, I'm always asked, "You um, have met so many leaders in your mm -hmm. in your life. What what creates really leadership?" And um, I would say it's very simple. It's just five things. So many books, and when I was a professor, of course, I had to read all those books. But <laughs> now, after having met so many people, I would say there are 
five, five very simple elements. A leader needs brains, soul, heart, muscles, and nerves. <laughs> let, me, let me explain, let me explain. You have to be a professional. I mean, um, uh, you all uh, are professional. You have to be the best at what you are doing, or at least among the best. That's the brains. But you have to have values. You, you, you have to be, um, you have to have a vision long term based on values. That's the soul. You have to do with passion what you're doing and compassion. And that's the heart. But you have also to translate your vision into action. That's the muscles. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have to have good nerves. <laughs> so um, why good nerves? That's and, no, and why, why good nerves? Good, uh, yeah, and, and unpack that. But but some people people ask me usually who is fulfilling those five criteria. <laughs> now, um, I will give the question back to you. Um, do you know any leader who 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 really fulfills the five five criteria? Uh, it's I, a little bit like the German answer. Not enough. Not enough, and I have met very few. I would say for me, the most, I had the great fortune to, to because I met him. I was the first to visit him when he came out of uh, prison. Nelson Mandela certainly uh, incorporated all five of those mm -hmm. dimensions. Um, mm -hmm. But then it becomes very difficult. Usually one or two dimensions are missing. So, I would wish you brains, soul, heart, muscles, and good nerves. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Let's go to the floor. Please identify yourself. You have one question, and please end with a question mark. Well, hello. My name is uh, Hannah Ellery. I'm a freshman at the college here, Harvard College. Um, my question is a bit about the Renaissance you talked about. Um, you talked about how technology combined with a universal basic income could potentially allow people to pursue creative interests, uh, social interests, that sort of thing. Would that be available to every country in the world? Would developing countries be able to take advantage of that? And um, how would you see developing countries coming into that renaissance, if not? So two answers. Uh, of course, those technologies favor countries which are already, in principle, which are already advanced. But, th let's say, less developed countries, um, emerging countries, could leapfrog. Uh, just take, um, we have, for example, a social entrepreneur whom I met yesterday at our meeting, and he told me how he is bringing electricity uh, to hundreds of Indian villages. Um, in the past, you needed uh, big uh, grid systems, centralized production of electricity. Today, with solar energy, you can have pr distributed production. So I use this example to show with modern technologies and look, uh, let's say, at mobile um, digital access to uh, knowledge, um, you can jump forward. And if you go, for example, to Nairobi and you see um, the start-up community, even in a country like uh, Nairobi or in a country like Kenya, it's surprising. <coughs> so uh, there's the two sides. There are two sides, and um, even in a in a in a, in a I, I think it it depends very much today how much a city is capable to create a. Uh, ecosystem which favors entrepreneurship because coming back to what I said before in the future maybe even the word employment will disappear you have to look for self-employment and the traditional way to be employed by a big company lifelong so is a thing of the past mm -hmm. please hi hello my name is Asset I'm from Kazakhstan Professor Schwab, it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm a proud member of the Global Shapers community. Um, so my question is, last week it was announced that you decided to step down as the president of the World Economic Forum. 
uh, and the new president is coming, who is currently foreign affairs minister of the Nor Norway. And uh, why did you decide to step down? First question. Second question, shall we expect some changes or any changes to the activities of the World Economic Forum? Thank you. Your, your, um, your, it's, it's a good question, um, but I may frighten you or I may, um, let's say, please you by saying nothing will change. <laughs> but um, no, no when, when the forum became a, officially an international organization, um, of course we had to establish um, uh, rules, encapsulated in our statutes and charter, which really guarantee best practice governance. And today, at least in, in, in the international system, if I take World Bank and so on, the best practice is to have a separation of uh, the chairman's function and of the president's function. I have a very um, highly capable um, um, managing board and I was presiding the board of trustees and the managing board and what we are doing now is uh, to, to have a split of those two functions. I remain full-time executive chairman and uh, the um, uh, present um, Norwegian um, um, foreign minister, Berge Brende, um, he will join me uh, to exercise the function of the chairman of the managing board. So it will not change, it will rather accelerate what we are doing. Good to hear, thank you. Yeah, please. Good evening, thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Bing Xie and I'm a dual degree student at the Wharton School MBA program and the Harvard Kennedy School MPA program. Very good to be here. I have two questions. Um, one, there is an increasingly amount of people who are choosing to do dual degree programs, whether it's between the business school, design schools, um, and, and uh, divinity school, and here at the Kennedy School. Um, what advice and suggestions do you have for those of us who choose to have a career not in one sector, but between the public and private sectors? Um, and my second question relates to your earlier comment about social emotional learning and soft skills. Um, as a, per, as a person who's very interested in the sector, what um, particular advice or suggestion you have for um, us who are interested in the sector? Thank you very much. Thank you. I, uh, of course, at the Kennedy School, um, uh, I have to say, um, uh, I would give, let's say, priority and preference uh, to a public service career. But this doesn't mean that you have to work for the government. I think wha in whatever you do, there is a dimension of public service. And um, I feel today the most um, uh, satisfactory life you can achieve if you um, don't have to worry about your income, but you don't have to become necessarily uh, a multimillionaire. Um, I would phrase it in the following way. When you are in business life, the principle is to take more, of, if you have a balance sheet, and um, the principle is to take more out than you give in. If you look at your personal legacy, and, at the, and you think, um, how can you maximize your personal legacy to use uh, commercial language, maximize? I think it's giving more in than mm. taking out. Mm. So there is this difference. Of mm. course, you have to, you, I, I was tempted, um, um, I, I know, uh, three or four years after um, I had created the forum, I had the possibility to become the youngest, um, uh, managing board member of, at that time, the fourth largest German company, which was Mannesmann, which in the meantime has disappeared. So um, I'm happy that I, 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 d I didn't take this job offer. Uh, but what I want to say is, I feel when you, that's my personal uh, life philosophy, 
So there's nothing more satisfactory than serving society. And the second question I, I, uh, I didn't really understand. Can you repeat? Yes, um, soft skills education. So you talked about lifelong learning and how yeah. um, it's increasingly become an important part of Education 4.0. Um, could you elaborate that further as to some of the vision that you have or you have observed of examples that have been working and what more work needs to be done there? No, I just can enumerate the principle. I mean, um, but we see already in certain um, professions where you have to show your um, degree of uh, continuous learning on a yearly basis. And I think this will become much more common. Um, as a lawyer, as whatever you, it is, uh, as a medical doctor particularly, um, that you prove that you update yourself digitally or uh, in other ways. Uh, I think this will m come much more, um, but we don't know yet. Uh, there is no country which has really pioneered in this respect. Yeah. And, and if I take Switzerland, my, my, I don't know, is there any Swiss here? Yeah, if I take, Swi yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I take, Swi yeah, of course, yes. <laughs> of course. If I take Switzerland, I would argue, and I think we are not alone, the teachers, particularly primary school teachers, are among the most traditional people in, in, in society. Yes. Klaus, we, 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 we need to keep an eye, a close eye on the clock. I do want to say, and I'm sorry we can't come to the other questions, uh, I, do, I do want to say how uh, grateful we are for the friendship, the partnership that we at the Kennedy School have had with you and with the forum uh, stretching back over the years. And of course, that also includes many others here at the business school, and Rosabeth is here and others. Um, y your relationship to this university uh, has been just a terrific lift for us. We're very proud. Iris is here with the Young Global Leaders uh, Program. She's been you know, running yeah. that for a number of years and done such a fine job. Uh, Julie Badalana, you know, under De Dean Almendorf, we put much more emphasis now on building an a institute or a, a place for social innovation, social change, and Julie has, has run the uh, uh, program for the Schwab Fellows. Uh, but you're coming back on a regular basis and inviting people from this university to come to Davos and to come to some of your other meetings. Yeah. This has been a very positive relationship for us uh, and for this, uh, for this school. I think we're all very deeply grateful. And I, I think perhaps the moment has come to ask Dean Elmendorf to come forward uh, and salute you officially. But thank you so much. <coughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for such, and to you and to David as well, for such a fascinating conversation. We have one last quick piece of business. Uh, in 1999, Klaus Schwab was, uh, received the Kennedy School's Public Service Award from his fellow alumni. And today we would like to add to that with a special Dean's Award in honor of your 50th uh, anniversary of being a graduate of the Kennedy School and of your lifelong commitment to public service. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I don't know if I should open it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I Thank you so much, uh, Dean Elmendorf. I owe, as I mentioned, the school a lot. I could mention, I see many people with whom I have worked. I just would like to mention one person, Chonai. Chonai, we know each other now since 40 years, and uh, if I had to enumerate, uh, let's say, the 10 people who certainly had most influence on my life, 
uh, you would be one of them. So a special, <laughs> special thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you very much. Sir. And and finally, when you leave, I should come back to the beginning. You will become great professionals, but always remember the heart in the five dimensions. So thank you again, Yo Yo Ma, to have brought the heart to us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Come back soon for our next uh, event in the IOP Forum here at the Kennedy School. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much.